Jeez, why didn't you fucking say something like that? Come on in. Got a good man yourself. Come on. Come on. <laughs> so I haven't seen you since March. Oh, well, I've, I've, I've been cocooning, you know, like, I've been, I, uh, it's, 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 it's a death sentence out there, eh? you know, so I've been cocooning. That's it, just. Uh, well, you know, it's, it, I was, I got the Rona at one point. You did? Yeah, yeah, I got the Rona. I was in, I was in the hospital. Oh Jesus, it was unbelievable. You uh, look, it was so bad at one point that my eyeballs came out of my skull, and my testicles went into each eyeball socket. So I thought I had, had my eyes where my balls should be, and my balls where my eyeballs should be. What? Yeah, uh, uh, and they put me on a ventilator machine, and I died. But how are you, you you're here now, how are you dead? No, I died on a ventilator machine. I died. They put me on the, they put me on the machine, but it was like that, right? And, and, you know, cause, and the, the fucking priest came in and got, oh, he's fucked. And he, he gave me the last, the last bill of rights, right? And I was dying, I was fucking dying, right? And then, beep, beep, he's going like that. How, how come your mom, Sharon, Sharon Gorman never told me? Ah, well, you know, we broke up. Ah, oh, you broke up? Yeah, because she was a, an ultra-right-wing conspiracy theorist. What? Yeah, yeah, she was a, she, she believes that the, the Rona isn't as bad as it's made out to be. And, uh, there was, it, there's not really a pandemic, and she was saying really crazy shit, like there was a 98% chance of survival and stuff like that. So I had to get rid of her. I don't want a Nazi living in my house. Oh, well, I'm going to believe that too. Well, you believe it's you right wing Nazi as well. No, fuck off. No, it's not like that. It's like, you know, when you start objectively, well, what, 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 what does objectively mean? Objectively means, uh, when you, 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 you don't, you don't have feelings when you look at something. Oh, I knew what it meant. I just wanted to make sure you fucking knew what it meant. So you're a right wing conspiracy theorist too. No! You fucking twat! Oh no! You have to be because it, let me tell you what really happened out there. Re, half of Ireland is dead. Half of Tara is dead. What? Half they dead. See that they're playing down the numbers. They're playing down the numbers of how many died around her. Nah, do it around. They're, 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 they're making the 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 test are shy. They're saying that everyone is that half the people, most of the people that they say have the round don't actually have the round. No, it's not that true. They're all dead. They're all dead. You die. You die. The only reason I survived is because I have Viking genes in me. I have Viking genetics. Otherwise, I would have been screwed. Yeah, but did you really nearly die? Oh, I, I actually went to heaven and everything. I was lying down in the machine. <laughs> beep. 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 <laughs> and, the, the, and then, and then, and then, I, I could, everything fucking faded. It all fucking faded, right? It was all gone, right? And, ah, and then, then it was black, it was black. And I'm, but I was still aware, I was aware in the blackness, and I was going, oh, is this all that there is, you know? And suddenly, suddenly, a little dot, a little dot of louis, a little dot of louis appeared in the distance, and it got better, and bigger, and bigger, and bigger, and bigger. And, and I was in heaven, and I saw, I saw Jesus there. You saw Jesus in heaven? Yeah, and the Virgin Mary. I saw the Virgin Mary there. Ah, but 
But then me, me, then me, me uncle Edward came forward. Your uncle Edward, the one who was there murdered, robbing a bank. Well, was shot dead, robbing a bank. No, he wasn't shot dead, robbing a bank. He was stitched up. He was on active service for the Irish Nationalist Communist Organisation. They were getting funded. He was, a, he was, he died a bleeding hero. No, he was robbing a bank because he he owed a drug dealer money. Well, anyway, he was dead, and he was like, he was like, he was like, Anto, Anto, your time is not ready yet. You have to go back to Earth, and you have to serve the nicotine star child. What? The nicotine star child. What? What? What the? Nicotine star child. Yeah, what the? What the nicotine star child? Nicotine star child is. Is is the ultimate being of creation. He lives in space, or it lives in space, whatever it is. And I have been chosen as the gaslight of the world, as he calls me, to 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 bring to bring messages to Earth from the nicotine star child to help uh, guide humanity, right? Guide humanity. Give another excuse. Give another kind of storage called guide guide humanity, re really, uh, and into the new aeon. What the neon? The neon is like a, a period of history. I knew that. I just wanted to see what you know what that meant. I oh, fuck off. Anyway, I was going into the aeon, right? The new aeon. And I am Ato Garmin. I would be the one who will who would be the, 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 the spirit guide for the nicotine statroid on earth for going forward. Are you sure you went to the mental hospital? No, no, no. I was in, I was in Tanner University Hospital. I was on the rest program. <laughs> beep, beep, beep. Anyway, oh, uh, uh, yeah, uh, listen, uh, the nicotine star trial. Uh, uh, well, how how do you, how do you do this? Well, what I do is I go into a trance, right? So give me another can of good Dutch gold, and I go into a trance, right? Now, what I do is I I go back and I go, oh, nicotine star trial. Uh, take me, use me as your vessel to communicate with. <coughs> oh fuck it. Ah, ah, you see, I still have, I still have a bit of a rowdy. You're probably going to fucking die too, but you won't come back into the nicotine star child. Anyway, I'm lying here, right? Fucking nicotine star, yeah, nicotine star child, yeah. Make me your vessel. Bring forth, uh, 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 bring forth a voice. And then, and then what happens is that, uh, yeah, a great spirit comes through. A great spirit. A great spirit comes through. You mean like Jemison's or uh, Hennessy vodka? No, not that kind of spirit. It, like a spirit of a great soul comes through. Uh, oh, right, right, right. And, and the spirit of the great soul it gives orders for humanity, right? And I uh, said, uh, can you give me a demonstration? Oh, yeah, no, no, no problem. Right, right, yeah, right, right, I'll give you a demonstration. Right, right, right. Ah, Nicotine Star Child. Nicotine Star Child. Enter into me. Hey, are you sure you're not a Catholic priest? Shut up. Uh, Nic nicotine star child. Enter into me. Oh, I'm going now. I'm going to shut up. I'm going now. I'm the king. I'm the king. I'm talking through your friend. I'm the king. My name is Elvis Presley. I used to be a famous singer on there, back my beautiful soul balloon. And I'm now an operating shooter. Shooter, the man you know was Anton Gorman. And I'm talking to you to bring a message to people. Oh yeah, they want the message. Look away, look away, look away, the go for me. Oh, I wish I was a vaccine injected into the goes I wish I was a vaccine protecting the go from Look away, look away, look away, the devil flame. On a cold and gray Chicago morning, another little kid is died of the mortal corona. 
Up the road there. Sing with me, boy. Sing with me. Come on, boy. Sing with me. We'll, we'll free her to the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Ah, 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 Good evening, good afternoon, good night, whoever you are, wherever you are, and welcome to the Christmas 2020 edition of The Velocity of Now with me, Thomas Sheridan. I hope you're having a lovely Christmas yuletide and enjoying yourself, and you have every reason to enjoy yourself after this monumental year of monumental gaslighting. And if there's ever been a reason to celebrate, and enjoy a year coming to a close, it's this one. Because if you've managed to get through this with your faculties intact, and a s sense of self, and who you are, then you've done very well. Again, my name is Thomas Sheridan. My website is www.mossuponstones.com, and I also have a Wix site called Thomas Sheridan Arts. And I'm glad that you're all back here for this Christmas edition of Bon, and we'll be looking back at the year, talking about a few bits and pieces, and so on, and hopefully get ourselves emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually prepared for the year ahead. It's a, it's a very strange feeling doing the show this year, because what will always stick with me about 2020 is the unreality of it all almost like different overlapping space-time continuums happened at the same time that f meandered and faded in and out. By that I mean things like, do you remember when statues were the enemy? The same people who were tearing down the statues, the same cheese heads, don't remember doing that. They don't remember why they were so incensed by it. They don't remember what it was even about. They don't even remember that it happened because their cheese brains are moved by the mainstream media and the bureaucrats on to the next thing. And the next thing was, of course, the lockdown. And they changed their ire. Well, they were coached in their ire away from hating statues and being so passionate about a topic that means nothing to them, to most of them, 99% of them, and on to developing hatred towards people who don't wear masks, who don't believe there is a pandemic, who don't want to partake in this global gaslighting, this modern version of the Committee on Public Safety, that's stealing our rights, stealing our quality of life, destroying our small businesses, and making billionaires trillionaires. 
I will say this, though. The Empire of Pestilence has fallen, or false pestilence has fallen, and I'll tell you why I know this. If you look at any of the comment sections of all the newspapers that were very pro-lockdown, the government is going to protect us. It has changed 180 degrees. And they're now filled with people saying, this is crap, this is all made up, this is bullshit, this means nothing, and so on, let us have our lives back. Now, what this has led to is a polarization, particularly coming towards Christmas. The governments and the bureaucrats, especially your civil servants, the enemies of humanity, what they did was they decided to basically destroy a traditional Christmas for everyone in the hope that the people who are waking up in huge numbers towards what a lot of crap this is are then blamed by the terrified ninnies who are still in the state of psychic deterioration over a pandemic that doesn't really exist. It's just the seasonal flu with a new name. And they gaslight us constantly by telling us this. They don't, they don't, they don't hide it. They just don't hide it. And this is why us that have survived 2020 intact, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, in whatever way, has every right to enjoy this year. Or this festival season. Especially if you've woken up to what crap that it all is. That they've voiced it upon us as part of their new reset or great reset. Or a desire to change who and what we are as a society and people. So if you look at the the whole Black Lives Matter taking the knee thing. I can't breathe. And that whole mass hysteria among the middle class. Upper middle class. Their ire now has been directed towards those of us who don't believe in a pandemic. So we're going to be now, well, we are being deliberately blamed for ruining Christmas for everyone. This was the agenda with the politicians and the vaccine companies and the the mass media and the, the bureaucrats. This was the agenda to have them now blame us. And don't forget, there's also ones who are absolutely loving it and don't ever want this to ever end because they finally have meanings to their empty lives. These cheeseheads have ritual, they have obedience, they don't have to worry or think about anything anymore. They have been told exactly what to do by government. They don't have to indulge in any kind of Pavlovian learning process to go through life. These are the empty inside NPCs with nothing in there. They've never developed anything by intuition or by initiative. It's always been a copycat thing. They learned how to use a knife and fork. By watching someone else use a knife and fork. They couldn't look at, oh, this one has a serrated sharp edge. This is for cutting the food. This one has prongs on it. This is for picking up the food into my mouth. They could not have ever figured that out. It was only by watching someone else use a knife and fork that they were able to actually use a knife and fork themselves. They can only follow others. And this is a good 70% of the human race. And this good 70% of the human race has never been happier. Because they know are in a stage where they no longer have to do as they're told, do what they have to do on their own initiative by following others. There are specific rules and guidelines around the COVID-19 thing that makes them very, very comfortable. It means they don't have to guess. They don't have to improvise. They don't have to use their moxie or intuition. I love that word, moxie, and you know, good old fashioned word in order to get it by in life. They now know the specific rules and protocols, and they can follow them, and everything will be fine for them. There will be no anxiety in terms of not being sure anymore. Everything is a sure thing now. Everything is guaranteed. Rules and regulations, and they've never, ever, ever been happier with this. On the other side of the spectrum is us that have seen right through this false empire of pestilence. Now, as I said, there's definitely a polarization there, and there's a middle ground of sort of semi-cheese heads who are even them being brought over to the scamdemic side of the equation, and you're seeing it. I talk to people in their jobs that six months ago, the mem- everyone was in a state of hysteria at workplace. Now they're all saying, it's all bullshit, just end it, Let- we have to get on with lives. But there'll always be one or two ninnies who will scream, you're not going to kill my elderly father. 
you're not going to kill my elderly grandmother, these types. Those people don't care about their elderly parents, their elderly grandparents. They only care about themselves and using themselves and this pandemic, scamdemic, to make them the moral arbiters of everyone else around them. And currently we have a situation where we're in lockdown and the Western economy is being destroyed, not for the sake of elderly people who are vulnerable. Remember, the average de- age of debt is 82. But we're in lockdown to protect those spineless ninnies. Now, this is a huge factor in society, particularly amongst males in the West. One thing that I will take from 2020 more than anything else is the absolute sheer cowardice of the average Western male. You know the way they all suffered from anxiety? They all had anxiety. Oh, my mental health, my mental I'm, I'm anxious, I have anxiety. Let me tell you what anxiety in a male really is. Anxiety in a male is cowardice. Cowardice. If you meet a man who tells you, I suffer from anxiety, what he's saying is, I am a coward. And you remember that, and if you don't believe that now after going through 2020, then you're not paying attention. Cowards. Many men in the West are spineless, maggoted cowards. They have no backbone. They stand up for nothing. They do nothing that will cause anything to rock the boat. And they will deliberately pick the most easy option in order, in order, To avoid being anxious, i.e. cowards. Cowards. You know them, and that's what they're like. For so long they've hidden behind this thing of, I'm, I'm, I I suffer from anxiety, I'm, 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 I'm anxious, I suffer from anxiety, me nerves, me nerves. What they really are saying is, I am a coward. I am a weak, spineless male. That's what they're saying. Part of your life as a man growing up, is to develop a backbone. There is nothing more despicable, treacherous, and evil than a weak man who's frightened. Or should I say, as they call it these days, suffering from anxiety. They are the most despicable, backstabbing, cretinous lowlifes you'll ever meet. They are absolutely beyond any redemption in terms of being decent, because they have been able to use their cowardice under a mental health thing called anxiety, and then they're able to weaponize it against other people by taking sides, backstabbing, and believing that they're on the winning team. And when they believe they're on the winning team, they are especially treacherous, repugnant, and evil. And that's the word I was use, evil. There's nothing more evil and despicable and treacherous than a weak, frightened little man. What can I say? It is what it is. And 2020 has given the wicked, despicable, spineless little maggot of a man the excuse to become the moral arbitrator of everyone else. This is the kind of individual you would have got at Nazi death camps and in gulags who would have went to the officers and the the ones in charge of the brutality and gone, didn't I do good today? I'm on your side. Yes, I'm on your side. Didn't I do good today? Didn't I do good? And you take the heart in that. If you're like me and the others who said, this scandemic this scandem- thing is just pure bullshit. We should have never been locked down. They should have just protected the vulnerable. You take that as an a sign of honor when one of these maggoty men, one of these maggoty men, you know, little ball shitbags following around a mobility scooter for the rest of his life because he's too, he's too much of a spineless maggot to do anything, do anything honorable. Joining in with the branch covidians to point the finger at you. You remember this. Now, we all get, we all have an anxious moment in life. We all have that dark night of the soul. But you pull out of it by dealing with it. You pull your bootstraps up and you, and you go, you go on. You move on. 
nowadays we have a situation where the spineless maggoty man claims he suffers from anxiety. And therefore, everyone has to pussyfoot around them. And that's what, exactly what's happening. You're not putting my elderly parents at risk. What you're really saying is, I'm terrified, I'm terrified. That's what they're really saying. That's what they're really saying. Now, the repercussions of this are enormous. I always think back to 2001, sorry, yeah, 9-11-2001. I always think back to that. And these parents sitting there with their young children, looking googly-eyed at the TV in a state of terror, which was totally, or, you know, shock, which was totally understandable. Instead of sheltering their children from it, Pop, Pop is in a state of terror, thinking that the Al-Qaeda is going to be flying a jet into the living room in, you know, Milton Keynes or Garden City, New York, uh, London, or Garden City, New York, or anywhere. That's, there's, no, there's no danger. And this makes the kids terrified. And this has effects on the children, okay? And those children grew up not really depending on their parents because their parents failed them at 9-11. And what happens is, when your parents fail you, there's lots of repercussions, but let's talk about the day. So for the past year, you've had countless numbers of maggoty men in a state of terror, watching the BBC, CNN, and all the other TV shows daily in COVID death numbers, being in a state of wearing a mask, the eyeball on the side of the head, living in absolute terror, and they have young children watching their father behaving like this. What does maggoty man who suffers from anxiety, i.e. cowardice, what's the message he gives out to his younger children who've been watching this fiasco in 2020? Daddy is a coward. Daddy cannot protect me. That's what subconsciously goes into their minds. Where a normal parent would say, oh, everything's going to be okay. Don't worry, the media is making too much of it. It'll be fine. Don't worry, it'll be okay. You have these maggoty parents, these normies, these cheeseheads going, We're all, oh, we're all going to die around our kids. We're all finished. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Did you wash your hands? Did you wear your mask? Did you do smooth? All over the world. Everywhere. A, a fiesta of cow- male cowardice. So what happens to these children? Let's say a hypothetical son and daughter. The son grows up with no father figure. In terms of protecting him. Because Papa was a spineless, hysterical coward. Because of numbers that are being posted on CNN and on the newspapers. He will grow up to be equally as weak. He will fail his children. He will fail his partner. He'll be a spineless, treacherous maggot. Just like Papa is. Cowardice, a begat cowardice. He'll become a little mammy's boy. He'll, when he gets married, he'll be still with his mother five or six nights a week and will indulge his wife on the weekend. What can I say? It is what it is. A spineless, despicable maggot man. There are millions of them coming in 20 years, thanks to what happened this summer, because Pop and his terrors. The daughter. What happens to the daughter? The daughter sees a weak male role model. Therefore, she thinks that's how normal men are. She has two reactions to this. I will either spend the rest of her life seeking out weak, pathetic men like Pop, like Dad, or she will seek out tough, hard, abusive men who will just use her and abuse her and discard her. Because at home, all she knew as a child was pop in a state of terror. Pop in a state of terror. Terrorizing his family. Suffering from anxiety. Cowardice. Junior will turn to drugs, alcoholism, heroin, all these other things to forget that his father failed him. And in both cases, both Junior and the little girl will grow up and see Daddy 
not as the father at home, not the family at home. They failed them and frightened them during the pandemic. They will look to government. And this is why I now believe they were able to get people, so young people, under 30, under 35, so easily controlled is because these were the ones who were little children when daddy had his anxiety, cowardice over the 9-11 stuff. They've run completely into the arms of mama and papa government because mama and papa at home failed them. They couldn't protect them from Al-Qaeda. They couldn't protect them from 9-11. The jets flying into the... And they saw the mom and pop play the videos all over and over again. Pop had his anxiety, a cowardice. And Pop was a treacherous little man. And so, Junior and little girl grow up to be treacherous little people. In forever seeking... The strong father figure that wasn't there. And 2020 has created an absolute time bomb of future generations. That will be totally, utterly useless. Because their parents failed them completely. You might get one out of a hundred who said, Listen kids, it's not like this. The chances of you getting sick are very low. Don't worry about it. It's okay. Your mother and I will protect you. They would be one out of a hundred. The rest had the TV on non-stop with the BBC or CNN in a state of hysteria. Add to this, particularly in America, the ones who hate Trump. The reason why they hate Trump is Trump is not a coward. So therefore, weak men don't want their families exposed to strong men. So Trump standing up for himself, not afraid of anybody, That means he's mentally ill. He is a lunatic. The media is filled with bald-headed cooks, weak men. Why are they always, all these these cowards and cooks always bald at an early age? I've never understood that. No, no, I mean, I know these fellas out there are not like that, but bald. But it just seems to be that the biggest cooks always seem to be bald at an early age. But, um, and that's what it's like. That's, that, that is what it's like. Frightened little men raising frightened little children who'll become frightened little adults, spineless, treacherous maggots, an Orwellian nightmare looking at the future. And this is why the parallel society is absolutely more vital than ever. The empire of false pestilence has fallen because those of us who can actually see reality and deal with things as they are, has fallen out with the bullshit world. I'm always fascinated by cycles and secular events, you know, the psychic weather, I'm I'm into that. But also being a bit of a traditional pagan in that sense, I always look out for the portents and auguries and signs that tell us things about the fluctuating and malleable nature of reality. Now, the other day, we got what I would call a repeating event or a synchronistic echo. I was watching a video of a road in Norway and what appears to be, well, it is, as far as I can tell, a Russian rocket that's come up over the horizon. Remember, a lot of people don't know this, but Norway has a border with Russia. And up in that northern part of Russia is where they test a lot of rockets. And so it may look like it's flying over Norway. It's probably flying over Russian airspace. It's just hundreds and hundreds of miles away. But the rocket, what I think has happened with that's very beautiful how the rocket blows up. It leaves this beautiful pattern in the sky. I think what's happened is the rocket has blown up. And the, the multi it's a multi-stage rocket like they all are to get into space. And... What you're seeing is one stage goes one direction before it burns out in the upper atmosphere, and the other stage goes the other direction. And that's why why you get these spirals and twists is the the gyroscope is no longer guiding the rocket motors, so they're just spinning out of control. Uh, Rockets have a gyroscope in them. This is what keeps them steady as they go up. Otherwise, they'd be the bottom. See, it's not they're not aerodynamic. The bottom part would be swinging around. 
And so that's why you're seeing. And it happened over Norway. And then I said, why does this look familiar? The Norwegian spiral, which I think happened in 2009, I think that happened. Now, 2009 was the year I decided to actually start writing a book or getting it, you know, getting serious about this kind of stuff and putting my ideas out there. And it was a, definitely a sensation of a window opening. It was a different world back then. The things like YouTube were completely dominated by conspiracy theory videos. I mean, you had the likes of Alex Jones and Red Ice and many other people that a lot of them we don't not around anymore but even some who are like Mike Mark Mark Dice they had phenomenal hits on YouTube in the early days it wouldn't be unheard of to have 2 300,000 and then before just before YouTube was sold to Google and but when it was left feral like BitChute and Odyssey is now the vast majority of hits on it of the, the biggest numbers of viewers are people watching conspiracy videos or videos that are tackling the control grid, which just goes to show you the amount of work that the mainstream media and government propagandists and operations have to do in order to keep this under, keep their system going. Because as soon as the gate is open and somebody's given a chance to go to a new platform, be it BitChute or Parler, by the way, I'm on Parler, I'm on MeWe, and I'm also on Odyssey. Uh, they uh, they are given this chance to, to go f- make a run for it. They run. They will run. And the uh, mainstream media and the control grid follows them over eventually in in the hope of shutting them down. But that, that won't ever change because that's part of the parallel reality too. Part of the parallel reality is to is to remove yourself in lots of different ways. You don't have to go live in the woods. You can go or go into the wilderness. You find new territories and become a pathfinder in your own mind. And you move on. But anyway, that Norwegian spiral happened at sort of the golden dawn of the internet conspiracy scene. When sites like Infowars was really taking off. When sites like Red Ice Radio, which gave me my first start, I'll always be thankful for them for that, were absolutely massive. and. And there was loads of others who've come and gone over the years. But that was the goal. That was when the door was kicked open. And then slowly in time, these sites evolved, changed. These platforms changed. And the situation now is where everyone's basically being chased off. YouTube. Now, this is okay. I mean, as long as there's other platforms, people will move to them. And this is, this is how it works. If you see those great reset documents... Uh, Dave Cullen did a fantastic one on the Great Reset thing. He was reading the documents. They're like written by like children wrote them. And there are some people who will choose to live outside the big cities in small Victorian villages, away from all the cinemas and shopping malls and things that people want. Yeah, bring it on. Well, that's what happens when you move to like Odyssey and Parlor and so on. I'm currently coming to the end. I've got about another week to go of a, the most recent banning on Facebook. And what I was banned for, and it was really quite amazing, I just was talking about what, someone had said, what had you learned most from 2020? And all I wrote was that most men are cowards. And that got me a month ban. That's because that really hit someone's nerve. What can I say? It is what it is. It really hits someone's nerve. And a coward always knows that they're a coward. They might say they're, they su- they're anxious or they suffer from anxiety to cover that. But like I said, they always they know they know they're cowards. And being a coward, they're automatically spineless and 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 deceitful. So that obviously triggered either some purple-haired manatee in um, in community standards or some other maggot out there who just reported it because they have no other life to live for worth living and I can see I can see Facebook are kind of dying now as well see what you have to give Facebook its credit for is its convenience it's like YouTube the platform works very well it's easy to navigate it's easy to use it's it gives you exactly what you need right there and then and it has a good setup for discussion like a discussion thread type setup which which is Facebook has always hated. They never wanted it for that reason. 
All Facebook ever wanted people to do was post a picture of their dinner or announce their engagement and for and everyone to go underneath them. Oh, that looks delicious. Oh, congrats, you guys. Love hearts. That's all they wanted it for. And that's why they went into Instagram because Instagram is less discussion orientated and more sort of like, you know, instant validation, appealing to base ego and, you know, superficiality. And what happened was intelligent people got onto Facebook and started using it as a discussion forum. And Facebook hated that, absolutely hated it. Because that's, they don't want people talking and thinking for themselves and learning things and sharing ideas. And that's why people like me have been targeted. But Facebook appears to be dying now. Now, I've always, I'd be very, I would have been one of the people in the past to say, to say um, you know, I, if people said, oh, Facebook is finished, I would be more cautious to say, I don't think it really is, to be honest with you. It's, it's you know, I think Facebook is, you know, I'd be the type to say that, has kind of like found a niche for itself. And there's a convenience in the platform that makes it very, you know, very user friendly. And I would say that, but now I'm seeing the writing is on the wall for the, the writing is on the wall for Facebook. Now I can see it. I can see, you know, the specter of my, my space looming over them. And I think part of this is these signs that you see that again, a rocket exploding over Norway, a Russian rocket exploding over Norway in a spectacular style to give a kind of sense of closure. And I think about now 2009 was the year I I joined Facebook around the explosion of the ro- ro- Russian rocket. And now this, this other Russian rocket over Norway at nighttime video again is sort of closing, the, like two bookends, is it closing the end of Facebook as we move on to other places. I think I can see that. I can kind of feel it. I can kind of feel it. See, what happens is a lot of a lot of people have consolidated their social media in places like Facebook around me. And that, that's not because I'm amazing or special or anything like that. I think that I'm a good kind of facilitator of conversation. I, th- I like to re- make people feel relaxed and enjoy themselves. I'm good at parties, like, I'm good at social functions that way. I've got a good personality for making, I, I, you know, I come from the mindset that rather being anxious and being a spineless coward and making others feel anxious, I'm the type that I like to feel, make people feel relaxed and happy and enjoy themselves. Because it makes it better for me too. And we all win in the end. And I've, I've used, always used my Facebook like that. Facebook, uh, my Facebook page is a party. A laugh. And people, there's loads of people who, have nothing else to do with Facebook, but they just hang out because I'm there. And that's not because I'm this kind of amazing figure. It's because I know exactly what makes people feel better after a shit day at work or having problems with their family and so on. Just like I used the Epic Voyage videos during the, the Corona lockdown. I mean, they were just made for me as much as others because I felt being in the countryside, I was isolated from my friends and everything. And there was all these, couldn't travel certain distances, and there was roadblocks everywhere. So I just made them to make myself feel better and reach out and hope it would feel make others feel better. And it did. So, I, you know, I have, you know, I have, I have this, this, this instinct or God-given or Odin, Wotan-given ability to do this. I've had that since I was a kid. And... It's something I, I value greatly because I think it, it makes people feel better, makes me feel better, and it makes life easier for me and everyone else. And so that's what I used to like to do. And I'll, I, you know, I'm coming back to Facebook as long as Facebook is there, but I'm using other sites more and more now. And that's the reason for that. It's just that, that you know, you need people in your life who cheer you up because during my periods where I've had feeling down, there's been always someone around me that's helped, that's helped me up when I was a teenager and stuff. Like, coming from where I did, I didn't have much prospects in life. But there were people who were, there was always the odd person there who was, like, very encouraging and made me feel better. So I said, if I ever got in a position where I had, like, influence or a voice, I would always use that to make other people feel better and pull them up. And so that's, I've always, that's always been important to me to want to do that. And because it's 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 very it's very nice because it bounces back and they 
they will you'll you attract the right kind of people into your life. You get rid of the wrong kind of people, and you create a situation where people are bouncing off each other in a very healthy, positive way. It's great for creativity and so on. And so, what we've learned from twenty twenty, not only on social media but in real life, is the greatest education ever because we're getting to see people for who they really are, not only the spineless maggots, you know, the spineless cowards who suffer. Sorry. Anxiety sufferers, males who, you know, are treacherous and devious backstabbers with no decency or any kind of any ethics at all. And uh, we've also seen the wonderful people. And I can honestly say now that in my life, I'm surrounded by so many, both, you know, in the virtual online life, but also in my real life, I'm surrounded by some fantastic friends, real comrades, real troopers. Real benches, people at a dare, you know, that a dare with s- strong spines, clear vision, and, you know, straight shoulders, who know exactly what to do with life and what they want from life, and a dare for me when I need them, and I'm there for them when they need me. And it's just a beautiful feeling. And that's another example of how the empire of false pestilence has fallen. We have... We got rid of all the maggots. We got rid of all of them. The last of the maggots were gone. Many of them left in 2019. It's very interesting that a lot of the maggots all left and or ran away or showed their spineless anxiety in 2019. And that was almost like a, a getting us ready for what was going to happen to the big show in 2020 when they'd really show what they are. But also the troopers, the style, stalwarts, the the comrades, the warriors, you know, they would all come to the fore this year in spades. And that's what we should take at the end of 2020, really take that from this, is that they've actually, we've discovered real, real, real rocks around us as people, as friends, as comrades, as family members who are there for us. And there are people who are going to discover the opposite thing. There are women who are married to men and they discovered that the men were terrified spineless cowards who were a bad influence on their children leave him depart him he's not worth it he has failed during a time of crisis a man's job is to be there for his woman and his children especially his children a woman is an adult especially in this day and age women are no longer shackled to the kitchen and pregnancy they can take unless they're in the an Islamic Republic or something, but they can take care of themselves. But especially as children, the father's job is to be there to be the rock in a time of crisis. Not Papa switching through his T V stations, twitching in anxiety, i.e. cowardice, of the latest stats of an invisible enemy, blaming other people for not social distancing. I mean, I had one of them behind me in the post office earlier this year. He was, you know, t- saying things, you know, it wasn't when I wasn't wearing the mask. He says, oh, fell for some. The rest of us wearing the mask. We'll never be rid of this pandemic. What can you do? You know, behind me, these condescending remarks. I t- after I got my package and walked out, I said to him, well, the reason I'm not wearing a mask is so your wife's cock can, can get in my mouth. And uh, I just left him. As he- but yeah, it was one of these... These, you know, these moral arbiters, cowards, spine, spineless maggots. And, uh, but we've also, remember that, take that, we've also discovered who the heroes are. You know, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And then the spineless maggots run away in terror. For the easy option, what can I say? It is what it is. So yeah, that rocket over Norway was definitely some kind of bookend or closure, the exploding rocket. The second one, the one that happened a few days ago, a second, definitely an an augury or a portent, and it uh, doesn't mean there's gonna be big changes. It just means we're shifting into a different cycle of consciousness, which I think most of you kind of knew anyway. I was just looking at something the other day that Queen Elizabeth II is a descendant of the Irish High King Brian Boru, and uh, that makes perfect sense. Brian Boru was sold in Ireland as a hero. Because he defeated the Vikings. He did really. At the Battle of Clan, Clan, Clontarf. This is after a series of uh, wars against the Vikings. And other, and other pro-Viking groups in Ireland. 
but he was killed at the Battle of Downfall, at the Battle of Clontarf in Dublin, and an axe through the head. But anyway, Queen Elizabeth is a descendant of the Irish High King. Well, he wasn't really the Irish High King. He illegally made himself the Ard Ray or Hyde King by putting a crown on his own head. He wasn't selected by the King of Tara, which is how it was normally done. But uh, Brian Baru was a treacherous, genocidal individual, so it makes perfect sense that Queen Elizabeth is his, is his ancestor or descendant. Sorry, he didn't make her ancestor. Brian Baru was the King of Munster, and he declared himself King of Ireland, like I said, illegally, without the uh, the sanction of the, ki- the kings of Tara. That's how kings were selected. The king of each province would meet at Tara and select the Ard Reed, the High King of Ireland. He didn't bother. He just created himself High King with the help of the Pope. Then he started to march on Dublin, which was a vi- well, it was by that stage it was a pagan city again. It had been for about 300 years. The the Irish who lived under Viking rule gave up Christianity and returned back to paganism. And one of the first things he did before he attacked Dublin was to go to Thor's Wood, the Grove of Thor, where all the set you know, it was the, the sacred grove north of the city where the pagans had the the place to venerate the god Thor and burned it to the ground in the name of the the rabbi from Jerusalem, from Nazareth, and then marched on the city and reconquered it for Christianity. But he used he used other Vikings to help him. They wasn't all Irish against Vikings. There was Irish on the Viking side. Funny enough, they all ended up in Merseyside, Liverpool area, the Wirral. And that's a big Irish kind of consciousness area to this day. But that's where the Vikings went to after they were driven out of Dublin by Brian Baru. But uh, I'm not surprised. He was a, a genocidal madman who murdered his way and destroyed everything that wasn't, you know, Christian. So it makes perfect sense that Queen Elizabeth, Saxe Gotha in Coburg, is uh, a descendant of his because uh, that poisonous bloodline still continues. I was just thinking about you know, Hinduism the other day. I'm not saying any religion is better than any other or anything like that, but if I was to con- convert to a, a mainstream religion, even though it's not really religion, it's more like paganism, it would be Hinduism. Simply because it it's not from that Abrahamic branch. In In Islam, you're told to be a Muslim. In Christianity, you're told to be a Christian. But in the Vedas, the Hindu Vedas, it says, be human. In Islam, it says, follow the prophet Muhammad. In Christianity, it says, follow Jesus Christ. And in the Vedas, it says, follow your consciousness. In Islam, they say God is in the sky. In Christianity, they say God is in the sky. In the Hindu Vedas, they say God is with me, within me. Christians, Abrahamics, Muslims, Jews, they say God tests, God punishes, and God forgives. In the Vedas, it says God supports. That's because, you know, it's, we're dealing, dealing with a culture and a way of life. It's not a commandment. And they wouldn't have been able to get away with the stuff they got, they got away with in 2020 if we didn't have this dominant thing. That, you see, they, this is one of the reasons they also, along with destroying the father at home, turning him to an anxiety-ravaged ra- ninny, they have also destroyed the belief in a spiritual identity through things like Richard Dawkins and all this stuff. And so they've transferred, rather than destroyed, the the God, the punishing God in heaven, whether it be Allah or Jehovah or Yahweh, into daddy government. The the Ten Commandments are now the te- issued by things like the Ten Commandments of the Rona and this kind of thing. Funny enough, if you go to sites that are criti- critiquing Catherine Nixby's book, The Darkening Age, which tells us the true history of Christianity, some of the biggest individuals attacking it are atheists. Now, I find that very interesting. They should be happy about this. 
But they're not. The reason why they're attacking Catherine Nixie's book is because atheism, extreme atheism, and the prohibitions and the edicts of Judeo-Christian monotheism are derived from the same source, the same consciousness, and th- and they are appealing to the same personality disorders. So the one who goes around saying, ye shall be punished by God, are the same personality types who go around saying, oh, there is no God, uh, only science is the answer. They're the same types. And this is why they're on sites attacking Catherine Nixie's book. In another life, they would have been the Spanish Inquisition. They would have been Jesuits. They would have been Puritans. In this life, they're the same archetype, the same personality type, are all hardcore materialistic scientific atheists. Speaking of uh, coming through a portal, there was definitely a sense of something different happening with the whole convergence of a conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter, time and power. There definitely was something did happen when that took place. It it felt on the twenty fourth, it felt it felt different. I know there was something it did feel monumental while it was happening, even though he couldn't see it because it was either daytime or the cloudy, but you could feel it. You could feel there was an energy there as very, very palpable. There was some jeff definite feeling of this was a cosmic event that was affecting consciousness. There's one more thing that we're passing through into a new state of consciousness. And this is why you look for this is why I, you look for these repeating cycles. This is why this whole Mandela effect thing I think there is something to it. Some people are remembering what was what happened in an alternate reality and they're in a new reality now. Or some people are still in the old reality and not aware of what people in the new reality remembered. And you were switching into Another multiverse. I'm, this is why the whole parallel society thing is so important. See, it's very important. See, it's very important not to self hex yourself, your community, or your your race or your people by saying because this happened in the past, it's going to happen in the future. I'm not negative things now. It's going to happen in the future. So you see, like you see things like I'm saying. You know, if if you hear say things like one in five children will grow to be a heroin addict, or one in five girls will grow to commit suicide, well, you don't repeat that because what they're doing is they're hexing you to to make you do that to your children. You know, they're, they're hexing you. This is and 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 self hexing is the biggest problem that human beings have. Oh, you know, there's nothing going forward. I remember, like when I was growing up in Ireland. Oh, this country's finished. No future. Of course there's a future. Of course it's not finished. But what happens is those types self hexed and they make it exceptionally more difficult for the ones who want to, who want to uh, better themselves to do it. I'll give you an example of supreme black magic hexing. Ken Loach films. You know, I, Daniel Blake and... All the other films like that, Raining Stones, and all the films he has like that. Now, I mean, granted, like films like Cass is, is an amazing film. Uh, he got it definitely right there, uh, but it's just dark and depressing as well, like all his films. But all his other films are like telling working class people from his public school, perso- you know, standpoint. Believe this will happen to you, and you saw the all. Ultra- you know, in British TV, they used to have these things like kitchen sink dramas. And they were all about, you know, they were, they were ridiculous. Uh, all working class people lived in hell. You know, they were, the father was a dr- an alcoholic wife beater. The son was a drug addict. The wife was suicidal and on quaaludes and, and, and you know, downers. And it was always like, no, oh, I'm, I'm unemployed, I am. Uh. And it was always the people up north, like, you know, you know. Up here in Newcastle, I'm fucked. I'm well fucked, you know. Well fucked. BBC Kitchen Sink Drama said some fucked, you know, this kind of thing. This is to hex those people in the north of England. To tell them, you know, there'd always be all these, the worst kind of degradation, whether in a Ken Loach film or in a BBC Kitchen Sink Drama's Mersey, some of our boys from the black stuff. 
Merseyside, Manchester, Leeds, Newcastle, Glasgow. Always to hex the working class up in that part of the UK. Always to hex them. To make them feel like there was shit and nothing ahead of them. And that's part of the black magic that they use. The aristocrats and the elites have always used telling you this. And they're doing it with their own thing. You not see that? You know, it's going to be like this forever. The new normal. Fuck you. It's going to be like this forever. It's not going to be any different. Have to get used to it. It's here. Mask are here forever. The hell with you. Now that's another thing that I have learned from 2020. And and, and those of you who are, are, are guilty of this, pay attention. The ones of you who wouldn't shake my hand or scoured away when I went to hug you because you thought I had the Rona or, or you were in danger. And I hope the rest of you listening to this do the same. You will never get another handshake or hug off me ever again. Treat me like a leper once, and I'll treat you like a leper for life. How dare you? I don't care how terrified you were. By the, made by the BBC and CNN and the rest of them. What you did was was despicable and evil. I don't want you ever to come near me with a gesture of a handshake or a hug ever again, because you won't get it. The reason why you handshake a person or you hug them is to show them that this goes beyond a physical or a biological thing. It's a it's a, it's a soul meeting soul. Well, guess what? You're an outcast now for what you did. Another psyop they're playing, especially in Ireland this year, there's lots of Irish people live around the world, and they generally come home for Christmas. Now, some of them don't come home for Christmas because they want to, but because they have family obligations. And this year, the establishment in Ireland are trying to sell it as these immigrants, these people who live abroad, these Irish people who are abroad, have been relieved of the shackles of coming home to see their families. Now, I find that very, and the expense of traveling around the world, or wherever from wherever they live, to come home and be with their families. Now, I, that's a direct attack, firstly, on the family. But secondly, there are people who genuinely do want to come home and visit their family and friends at Christmas time. And they're now being told, ah, it's not so bad, you're free from it. Every, the, the, number, the number of agendas that are being played out by this whole 2020 thing, the, the deliberate attack on human connectivity, whether it's just like I said, don't hug, don't handshake, that stupid elbow thing. The, you know, any man who holds his, his elbow out up to touch my elbow instead of a handshake, you know what that is? That, I, I consider that the same as him trying to put his cock in my ass. That's what that is. After, when he hold, a man holding his, a man holding, a straight man holding his, and I'm no disrespect to gay men, I'm talking about straight men now, a, a straight man holding his elbow out to be, to hand, instead of a handshake, is like, you know, holding his cock out waiting for him to stick it in my, in me, in me arse. That's what that is. The same thing. Put your elbow away, you fruit. How many, how many people have been enforcing these lockdown mask and social distancing rules, particularly politicians, have been caught not doing it? It's just like, it's almost like they're deliberately doing it in order to laugh at us. And they are. That's exactly what's happening. And people go, instead of people going, doing the obvious thing and saying, oh, they're not, they're not worried about the Rona because they know it's not a pandemic. They're just using the controllers. They go, how dare Nicola Sturgeon didn't wear a mask? How dare Hancock didn't wear his mask? How dare, you know, Ferguson went off and rode his woman without his mask? They don't have the sense to actually, the cheese heads don't have the sense to put two and two together and say, that's because they know there's no pandemic and they're not afraid of anything. They're just burlesquing the rest of us to make us wear masks. 
Another thing that's going to happen, I know I'm talking a lot about the 2020 thing, it's probably not appropriate for Christmas Day, but hey, it's just streams of consciousness. And I have recorded this a few days, well, a few different days before Christmas, so these are just things that popped into my head. I recently watched that superb film, The Aviator, with Leonardo DiCaprio, made by Martin Scorsese, about the airline and movie legend, unfortunate story of Howard Hughes. And uh, it's, it's a fantastic film if you haven't seen it. But it showed how his great mind and his genius, which he did fulfill on so many levels, was ultimately stifled by his mother putting a fear of germs and diseases in him at the beginning. The first word of the movie is, she spells out quarantine. Watch that film again now, it's amazing how prophetic it is. But she's, she's baiting him and telling him about the people who died because of a cholera outbreak. And, t- and, you know, completely traumatized him about infectious disease and viruses. And a lot, this is, that's another thing that's going to happen with many of these kids in the future. Their parents will all make them into Howard Hughes's. They, their potential life will be completely damaged by they think there's diseases everywhere going to get them. And they'll be, they'll, every time they, what was interesting, and I haven't read any bio, bios on Howard Hughes, but he was from that glorious, amazing time in California where you had basically a, an alchemical reality. You had gold from the gold rush, oil from the oil. You had Hollywood, you know, magic. You had alchemy, you know. You had this the Spanish missions up along the coast from San Diego all the way up to San Francisco that were put there on sacred Indian sites that tap into the Indian magic. Uh, you know, just as that magical golden age of Hollywood. The film captures that beautifully. But his potential rob whenever he would have whenever he made a mistake or he had a moment of stress, he would break down and have a psychological deterioration based ultimately on the terror and fear of germs and viruses that his mother had put into him as a child. And now we have a time bomb of countless millions of young people whose mothers are saying, Oh, you're going to die of the Rona. You're going to wash them down. Oh, make sure you wash every little thing. Wash the bag when the groceries come. Wash it all down. You'll die, you'll die, like those people who dropped dead in Wuhan, those Chinese people on the video. You'll die, you'll die. Oh, you'll die, you'll die, you'll die. And that, that program is now, they've, sec- they've self-hexed their own kids. And there's going to be a time bomb of countless millions of future Howard Hughes out there, robbed of their potential life because they're terrified of viruses and germs. Watch that movie, The Aviator. It really, it, it's it's quite it's quite spooky. Actually, how that film starts. And it was, you know, if you watch if you're going to watch the last movie of 2020, watch The Aviator with Leonardo DiCaprio. Not only is it a fantastic movie about the golden age of everything, but it's also about how that golden age in one particular individual was destroyed by the same self-hexing forces that many mothers and fathers are putting on their own children during 2020 and the coronavirus hex. I have to laugh. There's a, an article going around by the BBC. How should you talk to your friends and relatives who believe in conspiracy theories? And it's put together by some wagon who works for the BBC, and she's like their disinformation executive or something. And she claims she's getting death threats and everything. You have to see this bitch's uh, Twitter page to believe it. Literally, it's all about how she's being attacked non-stop and fears for her life because she's fighting conspiracy theorists with articles talking about how conspiracy theorists is mental illness. A bizarre obsession with QAnon, which I don't know anyone has ever gone into other than their tickos. And... Uh, it's it's just this and just no all the comments are switched off. She's an echo chamber of talking to herself, and it's really pathetic. But the whole thing is like a conspiracy theory nowadays is 
uh, do we shouldn't it be better to have just like just quarantined the sick and elderly and got on with our lives? That's a far right conspiracy theory, and that's another thing too. There's only if if you are any way outside the mainstream, you are now compared to Adolf Hitler. You're not. Every aspect of your life is now determined by far right, and uh, it's, it's one of those things. As soon as I hear someone called someone far right, I know I'm dealing with an absolute idiot, an absolute moron. And another one, like one for years, I've always dealt with. Whenever I've heard an English person go on about Tories this, Tories that, I know, and they're still doing it, even ones who think they're woke, they're awake. That I know I'm dealing with an idiot because they're so totally wired into the two party system. Tories, 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 Tories. Anyone who keeps going on about Tories is most, not the most boring people, person you'll ever meet. But they've also, they're, they're completely locked into the Matrix. And, and there's so many of them who think they're awake and they're still Tories this, Tories that in England. It's like the most off-putting thing in an English person is going on about Tories, Tories, Tories. But now they've got a whole world going far right, far right, far right, far right. The same cheese heads are doing it. And you're supposed to like now, it's so hilarious. You're supposed to be understanding why people, you know, my, my, my friends, like there was this wagon that I used to be friends with, was actually posting on her wall. I, if you've gone down the rabbit hole, I'm here to help. I'm here to help you. Now, the reason why she said that is not because she genuinely cares about these people, but because she's been stoned out of her head every night, watching, you know, and terrified of the Rona, watching this stuff. Watching this stuff, you know, and then feeling a kind of a messianic need to save people and bring them away from conspiracy theory and back into the matrix. Screw you. I'm just looking there at poor George Michael. There was an article in Daily Mirror saying that he felt his family were cursed and he couldn't get his head around it. There's possibly a lot of truth to that. Intergenerational courses are a very, very real thing. And they can be broken. I get people saying to me all the time, Thomas, I'm, I, I feel like I'm, my family has been hexed. Or there's a curse on my family. And it moves from generation to generation. And they would list all the horrible things that happen. And I'd have to agree with them. I'd say, it's probably true. And then they'd ask me, how do I escape it? And I'd say, oh, it's very easy. Get away from your family. And begin a new life on your own, away from them. Oh, I can't do that. Well, then get used to the intergenerational hex. As painful as that sounds, and as drastic as that is, that's the only way you get rid of a family or intergenerational curse or hex. The only way. This is also what's driven a lot of emigration in the past particularly from countries like Ireland, Germany, Italy, Greece, and the Balkans, where people went to America or Canada or Australia. This was to get away from intergenerational courses. Whether they knew it directly or not, or instinctually, this is how you do it. And it's no use the whole family emigrating. So say for it as a family unit where there's a, a curse upon the family. Well, it's no use mum, pap and the three kids moving to Canada or moving to Australia because they'll bring the intergenerational curse with them. How you break an intergenerational curse is to drive a wedge between you and the family. The best way of doing it is for you, if you feel that you're in a family that has an intergenerational curse, is for you to emigrate. On your own, not with the whole family, and then build yourself a new life in wherever you go. This is very important, very, very important, because whatever the hex is or the curse is, it only functions as long as your identity is locked into that family. Now, when you say to yourself, what can I do? I can't move away. I have a couple of kids. And I feel the family is cursed. What do I do? Well, basically have to leave the family. You basically have to not have almost no dealing with them. 
if you can if you have to live in the same country try to move as far away as possible if you should have to live in the same city for whatever reason move away on the to the other side of town break that into generational curse find just make sure you do not have the same habits that the family carries with them i'm talking about habits now not necessarily the curse the effects of the curse such as you know alcoholism dysfunctionality failure violence misery that general sense of i'm not happy here how you know you've broken a curse uh, you, you must break the curse or the hex is that if you ever try to make up with the individual in the family and it never feels right that's because the curse and the hex is still there a disconnection burn the bridge close it off and help your own children escape the family curse in fact if you have kids it's up to you to try and do that move them away now they'll have to be told they can't you know the when i say the whole family moves away you won't escape the course you're like the family has it and then you know moves away to america or australia and then is still in strong contact with the family back in greece or ireland or, or canada or sorry or scotland or italy no it cannot be done that way you're still carrying the, the you know on the phone every week to them it has to be a clean disconnect it works the easiest and quickest way to do it is for you as an individual to just to just go away go away and build your own life and a new life if you somehow realize this that you have to break the hex and you have a couple of kids or something move the kids away from that element of the family and raise them as a new unit it's like the hex of the curse doesn't recognize you anymore because your self of sense your sense of self sorry is no longer hardwired into the family and the family identity. It's wired into you as an individual. And this is why intergenerational courses and hexes carry on for so, so long. This is why they do that. It's because people can't break away and be individuals. And the, and the ones who do get the black sheep of the family, ironically, is the one who escapes the hex. And that's probably what poor George Michael didn't learn. That's why repeating, you know, the the hexing, the back to the self-hexing thing again. You know, repeating the bad habits of the past. The hexing yourself, self-hexing. You know, that's that could not only apply to the family that you're in, the family unit that's dysfunctional or cursed, and you're completely repeating that, but also things that the family say or do or the culture says and do. Just like in 2020, you know, stay home, save lives. That became a mantra, you know. Social distancing became a mantra. Now, what happens is those mantras don't only appear on your lips, as it says in the Vedas. They actually, they they sing in your soul to the point where your internal inside state, your subconscious mind believes it. This is why the repetition of mantras that are positive and helping and life-affirming are so important. They're not just words said in your mouth. They're concrete forces generated into the depths of your subconscious being. So don't, instead of saying, stay home, stay alive, or, you know, this kind of thing, it's, it's, it's find yourself mantras for yourself that help you break both these intergenerational and social hexes. Positive, life-affirming, refreshing, and pathfinding in terms of a positive trajectory for your consciousness. And that's another classic self-hex, believing that government is going to save you. You know, like I was saying about those Finnish people, I say, Tories this, Tories that. In Ireland and every other country, you get the same. Where people have a thing where they attack a certain politician or all, all politicians are it's because ultimately are this or this that's because ultimately they, they expect in these, these in that entities to save them that's part of a self-hexing thing as well I couldn't give a fuck who's in power it doesn't affect my life and I don't I know, I know, I, I know nothing means anything in terms of their political persuasion because it's all the same bullshit except for Mr. Trump and the reason why I enjoy his presidency is because he's torturing the hell out of everybody, and he's enjoying it. And he's uh, he he was a he was um he is 
a break from the norm. Uh, he's not a politician. He was very, very different, a refreshing thing, and he, this is why he terrified the establishment. So you remember, this is, if you're going to go forward into 2020, let's stop the self-hexing. Let's, 2021, I mean. Let's stop the self, self-hexing. The self-hexing that's put into you, and the intergenerational courses that we're carrying, not in the family, but in the West, or in our human condition, that we start breaking them, and we become pathfinders of a new future, that we forge ahead for ourselves into a parallel reality. You know the the old expression, of be careful what you wished for. About, must be about 10 years ago now, I made a video, one of the first videos I made on YouTube called Never Mind the Bollocks, Here Comes the Venus Project. And I used the opening of the old Thunderbirds kids TV show, Five, Four, three, two, one. Did, 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 Fantastic stuff, by the way. But I was, I was laughing at the time because the whole, all the truthers were all enamored by the whole Venus Project the zeitgeist thing. The zeitgeist film, to me, just seemed like a big. You know, of course, there was lots of truth in it. But it just seemed like a big load of uh, neuro-linguistic programming with a load of theosophy thrown into it. And there's, the truth is loved it because there was a scene in the film where it said that the, you know, basically the, the Illuminati, or whatever they were calling it in the movie, just needed an event. And on September 11th, 2012, 20, you know, 2001, they got it. And then it showed a plane slamming into one of the towers. Now, the thing is with that is that the truth has automatically made the assumption that the, the Zeitgeist movie was was blowing 9-11 truth. But it wasn't. That's all they said. E- even mainstream sources, even Michael Moore said that 9-11 was an excuse used to attack the Middle East and bring in a police state through things like the, the Patriot Act and so on. But they, at the end of that film that talked about kind of like global conspiracy in a kind of a globalist mainstream sense, coupled with loads of theosophy about, you know, the the Egyptian Egyptian thing and all this, and Horus and all this, and saying, you know, that Jesus was like based on all these Egyptian deities. And they never mentioned Odin, of course, the real one that he's based on. But uh, because they always have to keep it Middle Eastern. They always have to keep it Middle Eastern. So, uh, it's definitely keep it in the, the Holy Land. But, um, at the end of that, they were saying, what kind of future do we have? Nice little neuro-linguistic programming fade. And then it goes, the only solution is the Venus Project. And I immediately jumped, what? The only solution is the Venus Project. And right there, I knew right then that the whole zeitgeist thing was a, was a, a was some kind of globalist talking shop pre-programming thing now that, that's why i made the video never mind the bollocks it's the venus project because i was saying to people hold on a second they're telling you that the problem with the world today is we live in a, a lockdown security monitored world have you even looked at what the venus project proposes everything that you claim the illuminati like that was a planning Depopulation of the countryside, people living in pods in built up urban areas, soulless environments controlled by technology, and a centralized computer which runs every aspect of your life through resource management. And I made the video, and of course I was attacked. Now I understand that there was young people at the time who were, you know, bright eyed and bushy tailed. And taught, you know, they were very idealistic, but it was also kind of like these middle aged wankers as well who were like loving it. And I remember going onto those groups and saying things like, hold on a second, and, and putting forward general arguments. And you have this like kind of atheistic looking guy in America, or whatever an atheist looks like. I don't know why I said that. In America, 
and he'd be like, oh, hardly college material, back to me, without actually confronting the, the points. And then I realized, oh, it's a, it's a cult. We're dealing with a cult here. Now, the Venus Project thing has come to fruition. Oh, let me tell you, also, the kind of people who are drawn into the Venus Project were Americans who lived in bland suburbs, in bland cities with no culture. And they had never been to a European city or a South American city or, you know, an Asian city that ha- that has that's teeming with culture. They lived in places like Day- the suburbs of Dayton, Ohio. You know, they, 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 they'd never seen that a city can be chaotic but be a phenomenal, m- majestic cauldron of pure culture. They'd never been to a place like that. And so they assume that they're bland suburb in Dayton, Ohio, with the same shopping malls that you get, and they visit or they visit somewhere else that's similar. The you know, St. Petersburg, Florida, the same shopping mall, the same strip malls. They didn't know anything better, so they're assuming that this zeitgeist thing must be much better. So anyway, I got well trashed over that. Very few people were able to see my point, and now here we are, ten years later. And what do we have? Klaus Schwab and the Great Reset. The Great Reset uh, is exactly what the Zeitgeist Project envisioned and what the the Venus Project envisioned. A kind of pseudo-mystical transubstantiation with the technology and the computer. Every every aspect of your life run. I can remember having a, 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 you know, a civil debate with a young woman who was involved heavily in the, the top end of the Venus project and with your man Fresco. And I said, she, she said, well, all food, she said, all food will be grown locally in, in plants using, you, you know, growing using hydrophonics. And I said, well, hydrophonics, the food doesn't have any flavor. That's why tomatoes don't have any flavor today. And also they lack minerals. Because they're not getting minerals from us. Oh, we'll add minerals. So even the food was garbage, you know. And this is what this is what they're planning for us. This is what they're planning. So all the ones I have to laugh. The ones who were screaming about that we need the Venus Project today are all going, oh, the Great Reset, Illuminati, Satanic, they're all doing that. <laughs> they're all doing that about it. And yet, ten years ago, they were all they were all sexed up for it. They couldn't wait for it. I'm going to get, I'm going to get me a pod in the Venus Project, a little pod, a little micropod. Have my, my ass wired up to a computer that will manage resource. We need manage, we need resource management. I read it on the, on the, on the file. I, I sat there watching Jacques uh, Fresco videos for nine, 19 hours straight. And, uh, it's the way we fight the Illuminati. That's what he said when, when he met with the Queen of Holland, Queen Beatrix of the Royal House of Orange, he said, it's the way to fight the Illuminati. You know, that's what, that's what they were like. And h- here they are telling you, we got, we got to, we got to stop the, the Great Reset, Klaus Schwab, he's Illuminati, the devil man. Devil man. And yet, ten years ago, they all loved the same idea when it was called the Venus Project. And, and here we are. And, and the, the, the Great Reset with Klaus Schwab will fail for the same reason that the the Venus Project will fail. And it's simply one thing, and this is an important one, I always bear this in mind, the Achilles heel of the globalists is they don't fully understand energy. They don't understand energy. We have got to where we are today in Western and civilization as a whole through two things. Coal and oil. Two things that these 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 globalists now see as some kind of mortal sins. Coal and oil. So they think that they can generate enough power from things like the sun. You might be able to do that in somewhere like Florida or Spain. But you won't do it in a lot of other places. And they talk about things like wind energy. Well, we all know that the average wind turbine takes 15... 15... I think it's 15 tons, yeah, 15 tons of silicon oil-based lubricant every year. And also, 
it has a diesel engine with a couple of thousand gallons of diesel fuel inside it to start it because the wind is not capable of starting the wind turbine by itself. The blades are too big. They have to be started by a huge, the same kind of diesel engine they use in train locomotives. That's what starts the turbines. The same, the same kind of diesel engine. And, uh, and this is the absurdity of it. Not mention that the blades are made from polycarbon fibers and can't be recycled. So they have to be buried underground in landfills where they'll never decay. They're, they're like, they're like ra- ra- radiation. You could not invent a machine that was more, you know, polycarbon hungry than a, a wind turbine. And yet, because of the phobia around oil, fossil fuels, and gas, well, gas is mostly made from coal anyway. Well, a, lot of, a lot of gas used to be. Now it's not pumped out of the ground. That's why you don't see gasometers around cities anymore. Because they, used to, they used to make them from coal. But, uh, boiling coal. And you don't have that anymore because they're up, these are, but these are evil things. Oil and gas and coal. So they have this thing that you can just generate things from wind and alternative things. Uh, but these, the, the thing is that the thing that makes real energy is combustion. Combustion makes the most, the most energy of all. And combustion is what really makes energy, whether it's a combustion engine in a in a in a road vehicle, combustion engine in a train, a locomotive pulling thousands of people, and even even they can be made like a, a diesel locomotive doesn't drive the wheels through diesel power. The diesel generates electric power, and those electric motors are in the traction motors in the wheels. So the there's actually, diesel trains are really called diesel electric trains because the diesel engine is a generator to generate electricity. And that's why you have electric railways too because they said, well, let's go the whole step. The, the reason why the trains have electric motors in them, even the diesel ones, is because you have higher set, you've got tremendous acceleration of capabilities with electric, electric motors than you have with, you know, any other kind of combustion motor. And this is why the... These electric cars are quite dangerous, really. They're, they're almost silent, so they can easily hit people. And But they also have tremendous acceleration, remarkable acceleration, because the motors are directly you know, electrical. That you wouldn't have it like a diesel car or a petrol car. So this fear of fossil fuels is the, will be the undoing of these things like the Great Resets, because they simply don't have the capacity to generate power. Now, how we've, uh, this has dared us in the face recently, because right now, because of the lockdowns and everybody at home, especially now that winter's here and they're all they're using all the heating and systems and everything, and the lights are on and they're working at home, that the power grids are literally in serious trouble. I wouldn't also be surprised if we're trying to if we start telling people to reduce the lights for Christmas or keep the keep the lights off because we're using we're having brownouts everywhere. The national grid in Ireland is literally what they do is they shut down rural areas so people in urban areas don't find out there's not enough power. And I believe in the UK they're having massive power uh, power capacity issues. Now the Greens and the, the those types are all saying put up more wind turbines. They don't produce shit those things, even with all the hydrocarbons and polycarbons that they eat up. They still don't in their construction, and they still produce fuck all electricity. And uh, the same thing is happening with the... Now, this is their... Ad, don't they, this is why, in Ireland, when no one was looking, very recently, they just commissioned a gigantic electric power station. And they kept it all very quiet, and run by oil, I might add. And um, that was all kept very quiet, uh, because they don't want anyone knowing that the... The alternative energy things don't work. It's, it's an admission, and I'm sure uh, the fact that the UK is commissioning more nu- nuclear power plants is proof that doesn't work either. It's the greatest fallacy that it's ever been. But they don't have enough power even with that. Because in all the years they should have been building more, I know some people have a problem with nuclear power, but let me tell you, I don't, I, I'm actually kind of pro nuclear power, especially when you see how few nuclear power power stations have had problems 
Uh, don't be comparing a 1950s Russian dinosaur like Chernobyl to the modern systems they run in like Switzerland and France and Japan. Fukushima was caused by an earthquake, remember that. It wasn't caused by the, the, by the, by the failure of the, the plant itself. And so that's, that was bad, that was bad location. But Japan has always been earthquake prone. But like these, the countries that are doing this don't have power prob- capacity problems, just like the ones investing in oil and coal stations, like the United States under President Trump. There's contingency there for failure. But in the European countries, with this obsession with green energy, we've actually not been investing in properly into coal and fire powered stations. So there's now a massive global power deficit capacity issues and this the, and the issue is caused by the move to the move the to the move towards green energy happening too quickly and green energy being basically well shite okay and this will be the undoing of the great reset because they don't have the power the power capacity to get all these things going so that's one of the reasons I'm not worried about Klaus Schwab. And also, Klaus Schwab is not as powerful as he's made out to be. You know, he doesn't have the great power that some people seem to think he does. You know, you see, this is is like how you self-hex yourself. You've already self-hexed this thing into reality by taking the Zeitgeist Venus Project thing, and you've already hexed that into reality by making the first Agenda 21, UN Agenda 21, which is mostly, when you read the documents, mostly rubbish. doesn't a lot of it's just common sense. There's very little radical things in it. And also, now, the Great Reset. Yes, there are very powerful people out there, like Soros' Open Society, who want this and all that. But it's not it's not going to happen as quickly as they want it. It's as simple as that. If I was to put my conspiracy hat on, I would say that the whole... Co- COVID-19 thing was a plan to wipe out the elderly to kill as many old people as possible because old people towards the end of their life of their life from an economic model consume more than they do in most of their life they're always cold so they know it's heating all the time they often end up on life support systems or dialysis machines and all kinds of things so they, 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 they need or they need more power towards the end of their lives so therefore to the psychopaths at the psychopathic control grid the elderly are seen as a burden upon the power system and the resource system. This is this is the danger of a resource based economy. You know, oh, we need a resource based economy. We need a resource based economy because capitalism don't work. You know, this kind of thing. A resource based economy turns you into an economic resource unit. And if you're not, just like George Bernard Shaw said, so, madam. Uh, please, please, please inform us of why we should keep you alive. If you don't produce your wort while you're alive, and perhaps a little more, then why should society take care of you? This is George Bernard Shaw, who be, he, he was be saying this to ordinary working class people like you and me, and even middle class people, and here he was up on Buckingham Palace with King Edward, and didn't apply the same rules to the saxe gotha Coburg types that he hung out with. But that's, you know, that's how they've always been and how they always will be. You know, this is why during the Rona lockdown, they were on T, like from Kay Burley to everybody, the Irish government ministers and judges, telling the rest of us to wear masks and all this stuff. And there they were, like it all had functioned in events without masks and not doing social distancing. These people see themselves as a, a, as blessed, sacred selected gods among fodder and uh, that's you know we're just garbage to them we are just excrement they are so they are so perfect these people that they don't have to worry about the same things that the little people do and you got we got I mean, I used to quite fancy Kate Burley but I wouldn't I wouldn't well, I, I wouldn't piss on her if she was on fire now to see their condescending attitude on the on the on the TV going Oh, slanging, you know, attacking people for not social distancing, and there she was not doing it herself. This is because they do it, they're, they're, that's for the little people. That's not for them. Same with the Irish government people who all oh, went to that golfing gala dinner. It's not for us, it's for them. 
This is the the elite. This is how they think. They this is how they they see us. We're not we're like animals to them, and they're you know blessed sainted beings of light who can do no wrong. And when they do wrong, it's not their fault. It's us, our fault for finding them, catching them, doing it. This is how they function. And they'll never change. They'll never, you know, even in communistic societies, the whole thing is like, you know, didn't Chairman Mao have a huge fleet of, you know, foreign sports cars while, you know, having his population eat a bowl of rice? This is the kind of, this you know, this will never be done. As long as you have those elite classes that you look up to for leadership, you'll always be subject to this hypocrisy and this thing. But they, they're, they're then we depend on their guidance and their benevolence and altruism in order to, you know, bequeath upon the rest of us salvation. And then you find that they're just, they're just hypocritical idiots, most of them. So, therefore, by putting your hands... See, this is the ones of you that went like, Oh, we need to find the photo. We need to find it. I need to fucking find the photo. Yeah, yeah, resource-based management. And they're now going, Oh, no, so, no, no, the way we said, they're going, going, going to control me. Oh, they're they eliminating. Well, the lesson that you should learn from this is to no longer put your, any of your fate in ex- exterior control systems. Because every system is a control system. That's of a greater force and put yourself in that is what you're basically doing is you're making yourself a prisoner I had predicted that towards 2020 the end of it that UFO sightings would be off the scale or at least increase exponentially and sure enough It's just been reported that New York City has had its most UFOs ever. And this is directly related to the the psychic state of the population. As you know, I don't believe in alien visitation in these crafts. That these lights are a complete mystery. They appear to be sentient as if they're some kind of animal or entity. And they're not machines for the purpose of interdimensional space travel. It's hard to know what they are, but they're directly related, the ones that are not military projects, that is, to human consciousness. It's Carl Jung in his very first book on flying saucers. In fact, I think it's the first book on flying saucers ever written stated that at times of great psychic stress human beings project their fears and their psychic state up into the sky and from this we'll imagine beings of light angels and so on and that's what flying saucers were the latest in a long history of mysterious objects and lights in the sky that always seem to show up at times of great psychological stress on the cultural level. You can also create these things through magical processes. I'll tell you about that in a while. But first, I'd like to say, when I lived in New York, it was a UFO dead spot at that time. I can remember there was activity reported at the nuclear power plant just up the Hudson River it's called something point the name I forget right now but there was UFO activity there constantly reported that would have been because of anxieties following Chernobyl and Three Mile Island concerning the dangers of nuclear power plants that would have projected these lights up in the sky another interesting factor is that the Mothman was seen a lot around Chernobyl both before, after, and during the event. But I digress. There was that song, Strange Days Indeed, by John Lennon on the Double Fantasy album before he was murdered. And there's a lyric that goes, There's UFOs over New York, and I'm not surprised, or I ain't too surprised. Well, there was massive UFO, UFO activity in New York 
in the late 1970s because the city was falling apart. It was absolutely bankrupt and wouldn't be bailed out by the federal government. And the next thing you know, people are seeing UFOs flying up and down both the Hudson River and the East River. And it was commonly reported and constantly talked about. And then it suddenly ended by 1980. Well, see, New York is now in the same situation again today. Because of the lockdown and other factors, the city is thrown into psychic chaos, into psychic deterioration, and collectively people are once again seeing UFOs in the sky zipping around the city. And this is uh, fascinating stuff. It all ties in with my whole theories and approach to things such as psychic weather. And you can really tell, this, these would be the, the aversion, the version of a severe psychic lightning storm, a UFO flap. Now, that's not to say they're, they're, they're all created by imagination or the mind. They're probably a combination of both. They may be a reality vacuum that some entity fills. And in the past, they might have called it an angel or something like that. Today, we call them spacemen and spaceships. Crowley was absolutely right when he said one day, we, the day we call them demons, in the future, we'll call them something else. And that's what happens there. But the, the UFO thing is, it should increase in 2021. And we also have to be careful of the Project Bluebeam thing, one of the more plausible experience, uh, conspiracy theories, that that may be a factor as well. But it's just one more thing that shows New York is, or, well, New York is amazing. But 2020 was such a remarkable year. We're really getting the 2020 vision. And New York City itself, that island in Manhattan, is a special place. The way it sits at the end of the long strip of America, really. <laughs> and uh, you know, the Hudson River right there, New York Harbor, the granite of the place. This, 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 it's got a, stra a strange energy about it, particularly when you go up to the north part of Central Park. Places like Morningside Park on the Hudson River. Very, very interesting and strange energies. New York on a Sunday morning, Whenever, before everyone's got up and the sun rising is a beautiful place. It's very ethereal. And there's all kinds of areas in it that are kind of like strange twilight zones. I don't know how it is now. But one I'll always, I'll always remember was 7th Avenue, walking down 7th Avenue from Penn Station to 14th Street and into the village. The walk down 7th Avenue, which used to be a, a garment district, I believe, at one time, and also contains a very fascinating skyscraper that has no windows in it. It's basically the CIA's, the CIA's central operating telephone system. I don't know what's in there now, but it's, uh, it's it was on that strip. And the whole area had a spooky vibe. Very strange. Very, very strange vibe. And if the rest of the city was packed, it was always really quiet around there, even on a busy day. It was just like that. New York is strange that way. There, there, are, there, are, there are avenues that are wildernesses, like 7th and 8th and 9th Avenue at certain midtown locations and down around the meatpacking district. Now, again, it might have changed since I was there, but that was like that too, where the old West Side Highway was. It just, it's almost like nobody was there. And it's just part of the whole mystical nature of the place. That's why it was chosen for the 9 11 Stargate to trap, to trap us, try to attempt to trap us into a specific reality. It didn't happen. And that's why it, it, the psychic shock, although it did affect many, many of us who, like the ones who would listen to this show, were not thrown through the Stargate in the same way the rest of society was. And it allows us to see where we are now. We're immune to the sign of NPC normie programming 
But there you go, and I expect more of these UFO things. I also wouldn't be surprised if there was a big increase in crop circles. Remember, the crop circles happened at the time England, UK, England in particular, was in a lot of difficulty with the Thatcher years and the miner strike and the IRA thing and the economic uncertainties and the massive social changes within English society. And I believe that those crop circles, although they're made by people, Having spoken to some crop circle makers, they say they're in a trance and they've often made circles and don't remember having made them. But they were there. They they kind of like come around. They were, they were in the middle of the field, this complex crop circle. I believe that was also part of the UFO phenomena. That's why I think it was stitched into that. The mowing devils were literally under a shamanic influence of some super elevated part of consciousness that worked through them and the psychic state of humans is always reflected in these things this will make 2021 interesting for lots of reasons no matter what happens but yeah there you go just like i said and just like i predicted ufo flaps are back big time and so in closing as we finish this Christmas VON 2020, it's extremely important that we finish this on a positive note. If there's any theme to this show that's running throughout it, it has been about not self-hexing either ourselves as individuals, ourselves as family and friends units, ourselves as communities, and ourselves as human race. This is how they're going to try to sell their new normal. They're going to try and make it in such a way that you feel that there is no alternative. And this is what it is. And this becomes the self-hex. The spineless, cowardless, cowardly man loves to self-hex themselves and others. Because by doing this, they don't have to challenge themselves. And that's how I want everyone to look back at 2020. As not a horrible year, not a miserable year, not a wasted year, but a challenging year. We were challenged. And if you're here listening to the show now, and you've got your emotional and psychological faculties intact, and you haven't been broken down by the endless propaganda, well, then you triumphed. You've completed the monomyth that was 2020. You have passed through the shadow and you have made it to the dawn. But we're still in the blue hour. That means we haven't reached the main dawn yet, which will probably happen in the spring when the birds start singing again and the leaves start coming back on the tree and the days get longer. But we survived. We made the worst of the dark night of the soul in terms of what society fostered upon us. We got here. We made it. This means that in 2021, we're now personally, socially, culturally, and globally, as the tribe, possessing the faculties in order to survive whatever 2021 and beyond brings. It's come to my attention, and some, many of you others will know this, I recently did a show with Fiona Edgar, that we are reaching a changeover in society. The Kali Yuga appears to have come much sooner, according to many Brahmins, and is likely to happen in 2024. This would also cater for adjustments within the Mayan current calendar, if you're a Christian, you can see it as the apocalypse, the revealing. But a cycle of consciousness is ending, and we're in the final few years of it. And just like when any relationship ends, the last period is almost the most difficult before the new one begins. And this is what we have to keep in focus. The 2021 will be beginning of the end of the new challenge of getting used to the end. By that I mean in 2020 we were informed personally and in every other way that 
we were now in the new world. But it's not a new world of permanence. It is a situation of flux to go into the new reality, which will appear around 2024, 25. From that point on, we will enter into the beginnings of a new renaissance and a glorious period of art, creativity, and the, and the human dynamic reaching its full potential within this cycle. Kali Demon is fighting in its death throes right now. And this is what we want. This is what we need. We all knew something was coming. It's here. 2020 was a challenge. It wasn't a catastrophe. For most of us, it was a challenge. We overcame the challenge and we should pat ourselves on the back for that. The amount of propaganda that was unleashed this year was absolutely staggering. Governments and bureaucrats and mass media were gaslighting us, literally by the second and in real time, using their algorithms on social media to almost predict what the normies were going to say and think, and then to proactively jump in there with a situational process to address it in real time. And then there's us that that didn't happen to. And the reason why it didn't happen to is because we're at the end of a 10-year cycle that began with us waking up around 2009, 2010, 2008, depending where you came in. A world cracked open. We jumped into it, explored it, we saw it. And now that opportunity is ending as a new one begins. And we're ready for it. We are ready for it. So, be positive about the future. Plan, create, and make the most of it. Hold fast that that which is true, and be grateful for the comrades you have. We have gotten the greatest education ever. We now know the people around us who we cannot trust, who we know would report us to the police, who would stab us in the back if they had a chance, because... Their anxiety is cowardice, and as I said at the start of the show, there's nothing more wicked and despicable than a coward and treacherous. We know who the cowards are, we know where treachery lies, therefore we're free from it because we've detached ourselves from it. We are on our way, and I'm, for one, I'm very, very excited about watching the years ahead up until 2024, 25. Because we are going to get a front row sh- seat to a show that was beyond anything we could have possibly imagined. And as always, you sit there, eyes on the prize, true to your heart. Happy Christmas, happy Yule, whatever you're having. Much love, enjoy yourself, and get ready. The show has just begun. And you know what? You got the best seat in the house. The seat that knows exactly what's going on. And you say to yourself, feck them if they can't take a joke. Take care and have a great holiday season and have a great future. Because you know what? You deserve it and you deserve it to give it back to them. They tried to take the song from your heart. Sing it louder in 2021 and beyond. This is me, Thomas Sheridan. The Velocity of Now, Christmas Special 2020, and I'll see you here again for many more Christmases to come. Onwards and upwards. And you say to yourself, feck them if they can't take a joke.